TP-Link has sent over their EAP655 wall, and I figured this would be a great opportunity to compare it directly against the EAP615 because both of these products have a lot of similarities and I wanna know exactly what the differences are. So we're gonna explore that in today's video and I'll be hopefully teaching you guys something about both of these products that you may have not already known. So then in further waiting, let's go ahead and jump right on in. We'll start first with the EAP615 and see what's inside. Now, I expect them both to be dang near identical, but just in case, we want I wanna take a look. So of course we have the license, the pamphlet that tells us about all the Obata um, hardware, quick installation guide, the access point itself, and of course, a mounting bracket and some screws to help us mount it to a junction box. Pretty basic stuff. And for the EAP655, let's get this opened up if I can. Oh my goodness. All right, just like the other one, we have the quick installation guide if you need it. We have our license, which we definitely don't need, and the pamphlet that tells us about other EAP, or I'm sorry, Omada products. And then of course the access point itself. With, there we go. And some screws to mount it, but where is the mounting plate? Interesting first difference. So now that we've unboxed both of these, let's talk about their physical characteristics. And this is where some of the differences begin to show themselves. So obviously the 615 wall is much more thin than the 655 wall. However, they are basically the same dimensions in terms of height and also, I guess, width. But obviously the 655 is more thick. However, the one advantage the 655 has over the 615 is that it has perforated holes all the way around the unit, allowing air to get in and also escape, theoretically giving it better performance. Now, if that's actually true or not, I don't know, but I would like to assume that that is the case or will be the case. Both units have a button to turn the LED on and off. Both units have a reset button to reset it. Both units are 802.af compliant with PoE in on the rear on the gigabit port. Both of them have three one gigabit ports on the bottom with one of the ports allowing for PoE pass through to another device if you have it. Both are Wi-Fi 6. Both have the same number of antennae. Uh, this one consumes slightly more power at roughly about 12.6 watts while this one consumes just under 12 watts. I think it's like 11.4 watts. Don't quote me on that one but it consumes slightly less power. Both support eight SSIDs on both bands, so a total of 16 SSIDs for the 2.4 gigahertz and the five gigahertz band. And like, what else could the difference be? Well, I think the differences lie with the technology themselves. Now, I also believe there may be chipset differences between this unit and the 655, but I'm not 100% sure of that, but we will take a look at the insides of both of these and see what differences we can spot. But I think where the real differences lie or the differences that you guys will care most about are actually with the power gain of these units. So the 655 has a bit more gain on the five gigahertz band, which means that it's ever so slightly less omnidirectional than the 615. But I don't think that matters because with that gain, we actually get a more focused beam, which theoretically might allow us to get better connectivity. And on that note of connectivity, the EAP655 has channels that can have up to 160 megahertz of channel width, which is really where this thing shines over this. So that means you'll actually be able to get more bandwidth out of this unit than you will this unit. And that's probably where the biggest differences are between the two, and those are, that's probably what you guys care about most. So with that out of the way, Let's take these both apart and see what they look like on the inside. We'll start by taking apart the 615 because it has less screws and that should be a lot quicker to take apart. There's only two screws that need to be removed. Admittedly, this is a lot harder to take apart and since this unit doesn't belong to me and I have to return it to the original owner, I think I'm just going to not take it apart for fear of damaging it. Uh, more than I already have. So we won't be taking a look on the inside of this one, unfortunately, but we can take a look on the inside of this one because it is, or at least appears to be a lot more simple to take apart. So let's just cut ahead to that part. For this, there are only four screws that need to be removed. So that should be fairly simple to do. Oh, and look, they're magnetic, unlike the EAP690E HD. With the last screw removed, this should be pretty simple to open. There we 
we go. Just removed it from the shell quite easily. And here are the insides. I'm guessing one of these sets of antenna must be for the two, uh, two gigahertz band and the five gigahertz band. Now I'm guessing, although this appears to look like one antenna, this must be two because this unit does have two antenna for each band and this must be acting, or these must be acting as two antenna even though we see one structure. And then of course, uh, we have the different controllers. I'm not sure which of these controllers does what, and there are more controllers on the rear. So let's see if we can release that. Okay, well, uh, that explains why it was kind of hard to remove. So not only do we have this thermal pad, we also have a connector here that I'm guessing is for ethernet. So you can see that there are pins right here that are probably super easy to bend. So hopefully I didn't bend any of those when removing the entire board, the back of the board, because uh, I may affect the performance here. Uh, anyway, I'm guessing these must be the controllers probably for the five gigahertz band and the two gigahertz band. And then these other smaller ones must be the like chips for maybe power as well as each of the NICs. So we have three of these, one, two, three, four. So maybe this one's for the rear one and then these are for these. I, I really don't know. I am just guessing here, uh, but this is basically it. So pretty simple design, I would say. And you know, it's actually got a really nice color to the PCB. Uh, TP-Link really does design the interior of these things to look nice, even though hardly anyone's ever gonna look at them. All right, let's get this thing reassembled and let's start some testing. The EAP655 does mount to a normal junction box. Now, what's cool about the EA655, as I have three ports here, you can achieve the same thing, but with only one ethernet cable instead of having to run three separate ethernet cables. So that's pretty cool that you can use one device to get Wi-Fi and a dedicated uh, line back to your switch or wherever it may be. So let's get these two removed. We're going to pop off the, pop these off because we won't be needing them. Okay, so we'll be attaching this unit to this ethernet cable. Yeah, this is a little bit non-standard, so just ignore that now. We're just doing this for demonstration purposes. Now, in order to actually mount this unit because it doesn't come with a mounting plate to this junction box, uh, you can actually just remove the front face here. So just I'm just kind of pulling on it with my fingernails and it just comes off with relative ease. There we go. So now that we've got that removed, let's go ahead and plug it in. And it just kind of hangs there on its own. It's already getting power. And we should just be able to screw it in from here into the junction box once I figure out where the holes are. Honestly, this is a little bit more difficult to mount than its predecessor, especially for finding the holes, which I am really struggling with. But once we find the holes, it kind of just goes right on in. So there you have it. Now, admittedly, it was harder to get this bottom screw in because I was messing with the alignment. I honestly don't think it's in there, but the top screw is definitely in there and that's not going anywhere. It's not budging at all. So that's uh, good. And just put the face plate back on there and we are good to go. Now, admittedly, the older system where you mount the bracket first and then you slide this on there was a lot easier to mount, uh, but it was slightly more difficult to get off. But I definitely prefer the old way over this, although this is a very clean look and leaves almost no gap between the wall and the device itself. Now that I have all these pesky wires hanging out where they would normally be plugged in here, we can just simply plug them into the bottom of the device. And now anything that gets plugged in on the other end will have access to the internet or the local network. For this test, we'll be using a Wi-Fi 6E capable laptop, so that should be more than capable of handling both of these devices. And speaking of both of the devices, they will both be plugged into a 10 gigabit switch uh, that was also provided by TP-Link. To test both of these access points, I will individually mount them to this wall in my office and test each band and channel width at different points in my house. After testing each access point individually, I will flip the access point or reverse it so it's facing the wall. And then I will redo all my tests so that we can get an idea of how well the omnidirectional antenna work and what kind of bandwidth we can expect. With all the bandwidth testing complete, here are the results and my findings from my tests.
For anyone out there that's looking at the EAP655, I hope that my tests give you somewhat of a idea of what to expect in a realistic scenario where it's set up in this house with multiple walls and different types of materials between the devices. And I think that the 655 performs really well. I don't know if it's worth the upgrade from a 615 if you're already on the 615. I think if you already have a 615, you should just wait for the 6E version of this or maybe even the Wi-Fi 7 version of this because I think there'll be a lot more to gain from that. Now, that's not to say the 655 is a poor performer because clearly it, we can get near 1000 megabits per second off of this thing, but I just don't know if it would be worth upgrading to. Now, if you're looking at adding this to this device uh, for the first time in your home, it's probably worth the purchase, uh, but I'll let you decide on whether or not you should do that based off the results that are shared in this video. It's pretty neat to see that even though they increased the gain on the 655 over the 615, we didn't lose any omnidirectional functionality as far as I could tell. Everywhere that I tested in the house seemed to have really great signal, except when we were on the far reaches of the house through multiple walls and electronics in the way, and Lord knows what sort of environmental effects going on with radar stations or whatever it may be. Um, I think it still performed really well and I was happy with it. So with all that being said, I want to thank each and every one of you for watching. And of course, thank you TP-Link for sending this over for testing. And thank you, Luis, for letting me borrow this so I can compare them directly together. And with all that being said, I want to thank you all for... I think I already said that. I don't remember. Anyway, peace. <laughs>